Great to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Man, you know, uh, as you can see, again, uh, we have some instrumentals that are out with us. And I figured out that that was God's plan in the beginning. Too many times when we want to praise our God, what we want to do is we just want to sit back and just absorb it. God doesn't want you being a sponge unless it's His Word, okay? But when we sing praises to our God, He wants everyone to lift their voices before Him. And I remember as a kid, or even even in, you know hearing in Sunday schools, that if you don't praise God, don't worry about it, okay? Because even the rocks will cry out. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be compared to a rock. Just, it just doesn't sit well with me. So this morning, without our instrumentalists, I need your voices this morning as we sing our praises to our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us all stand up this morning. Let us sing hymn 413, Faith is the Victory.
just great hymns. It speaks to the faith, but more than that, these are uplifting. These are the things that help us to claim that victory. So this week, if you've been beaten down by the world, you're in the right place. This is a place to be, to fill up that gas tank. Amen. Let's continue to worship hymn number 405, Have Faith in God.
trusting God put upon his life. Today we'll look at the biggest test of his life. The test to sacrifice his son at the command of God. Genesis 22.1 After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Most of us don't like tests. Uh, it, it's because test, when you hear the word, you think about cramming as much knowledge as you can into your head so that then you can throw it up on a test and hopefully get it right. There's challenges known to facts and figures. God's test here is different. They involve reading, knowing, and then acting in obedience to what God has revealed to us. We may think that the people of the Old Testament are so very different, but they are not. They had to gain insight into who they were and who God was. And so as we look at the life of Abraham, we've kind of gained some insight into his daily life. He was an obedient servant of God. 
Do you feel you're obeying God in your life? Do you feel and God is happy in how you're living? Is the decisions you are making in your life based on pleasing God or pleasing yourself? Today we're going to look at some decision mountains and understand what it takes to be obedient to God the way that He wants us to be. Let's pray. Father, thank You for today. Make Your presence known in this place. Help us to understand Your words and not just be my words, but Yours. Speak through them and breathe Your breath of life into them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, first of all, there are mounts of decisions. When God, seems like when God wanted His people to make a decision, He took them up on a mountain. Leviticus 27, 34 says, there, These are the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses for the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. Now, we do not know for sure what is Mount Sinai. There's been different mountains claimed to be Mount Sinai, but we do know what happened on Mount Sinai. God talked to Moses, spoke, spoke to him directly, and gave him the Ten Commandments, the basis of God's law, and the, really the basis of all law across the world. But the Ten Commandments were given. These rules became the basis of the law and whether or not we were going to obey them or not. Then there was another mountain, 1 Kings 18, 21. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And we know that uh, Elijah came up on this mountain. He came up on this mountain after a severe testing of the people of the northern kingdom. And there was a drought and all these things that happened because of Ahab and Jezebel following after the Baal idols. So we know that happened. So we see it happening. They're calling them up and Elijah called for the priest of Baal to meet him on this mountain and for the people to come too. The people came and he told them exactly what he was going to do. And he said to them, if you are going to follow God, then follow God. If you are going to follow Baal, follow Baal. But don't go between the two. See, the problem was that there were there was God plus is what they were trying to do. They were trying to follow Jehovah God and at the same time follow the gods of this world. And so he said to them, you can't do that. You've got to decide between one or the other. And then the challenge came. He said he was going to challenge the God Baal to do something amazing. He was going to show his God doing something amazing. You know the story. They were there on the mountain and then they have the altar. The priests of Baal are running around the altar dancing and doing all their gyrations like they do. And then they couldn't get him to hear them and so then they began cutting themselves as a way to show de devotion to their God. And Elijah is sitting up on a rock and saying, well, maybe Baal is asleep. Maybe Baal's not listening right now. And if you read the text, he says, maybe Baal's in the bathroom. <laughs> so he gets through all that and just taunts those priests until, and they've been running around all afternoon they're all wore out. They finally just all collapse. And Elijah looks at the people around him and he says, okay, we have got a 
trough around the altar. I've got the altar prepared. He says, let's go, let's pour some water. They pour water, lots of water on top of it. And then he says, as he has already said, whichever God brings fire down from heaven is the true God. And he doesn't do any dancing or gyrations or anything like that. He just, and he doesn't preach an hour and a half sermon or anything like that. He doesn't cut himself. He just looks up and prays to God and asks God to show himself as the true God. And when he says amen, fire falls from heaven. Such powerful fire that it consumes the entire sacrifice on the old beaten down altar, burns it up and burns up and takes care of all the water that is around it. And God is definitely showing who is the real God. And so the people decide at that moment to follow after God. And Elijah has them, their first act of worship is to kill all the priests of Baal. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty nifty, you know. He has that happen. He talks to, to, to Ahab. He gets everything all worked out. And the people follow God for a while. They're, they're really good about this. Something massive will happen and they'll follow God for a while and then they'll turn their backs on Him again. But then what we know is what we know from the ancient story that we're going to look at today. Mount Moriah. Abraham's test of obedience. Genesis 22.2 He, God, said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and after offer him there as a burnt offering. Bless me. It's one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will come over there and worship and come again to you. And Isaac said, My father, behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went both together. Well, when God spoke, Abraham answered. You see what he says? Here am I. He knows that voice. Probably a little bit of a twinge in his 90-year-old bones because he thought he was through a test. But God had a test. You know, when God speaks, His sheep hear Him and respond. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. How do you respond to God's voice? You say, well, pastor, God's never spoke to me audibly. If He did, I would be worried about it. You know, He's never called me up on the phone. I've never looked at my uh, caller ID and seen heaven on there. You know, but God speaks to you. He may not speak in a clear, audible voice, but He speaks to your heart. He speaks to who you are. God speaks to you, and God still does that today. Amen. I know that's hard for a bunch of Baptists to believe. But yes, God speaks to you. God speaks and He says things through His Word and through other Christians. You notice that He took what was needed. Abraham doesn't question or try to talk God out of it. He just got ready and went. He just had reached this point with God, when God told him to go do something, he went and did it. You know, I don't know about you, but if God talked to me and said, I want you to take Caleb up on a mountain somewhere and I want you to tie him up 
put him on the altar, and I want you to sacrifice him and then burn him. Now, I'm a little bit worried about that. But just because I'm worried about what if I took Caleb out like that, what in the world would I tell Faith and, Ka Faith and Julie when I got back? You know, not to mention Daisy, you know. But he didn't question it. Hebrews 11, 19 says, He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By this time, Abraham has complete faith. He hears God, gets going with what God tells him to do. It's good to have that kind of faith. It's kind of that kind of faith that just dives from the cliff right into this pool. It's the kind of faith we need to have. He tells the young men around him, I will go and come again to you. Complete faith says that God can do whatever is needed to fulfill His promise. God is sure. God is strong enough. God is powerful enough. God is able to do what He wants to do. I heard a story one time about a man who was looking over into the Grand Canyon. And he, he, of course, was so very excited about it. And he looked and then looked and then eventually fell over the side. Fell over the side and he thought he was going to die. But he reached up and grabbed a hold of a tree that was growing out of the side of the cliff. And he thought, how fortunate. And then he heard the voice of God saying, My beloved, I have saved you. Now, all you have to do is let go of the tree and fall into my hands. The man looked up above him. The man looked down below to where he would fall. And he looked up again and said, is there anybody else up there? You know, he didn't have complete faith. He didn't have complete trust in God. Folks, we've got to trust God, especially when we get into hard circumstances, especially when things come upon us and we don't know what's, what we're going to need to do. Complete faith says, I will do it. It doesn't think about limitations that it completely trusts in God's abilities. Luke 137, nothing will be impossible with God. That's a good verse for you to remember. It's a good verse for you to put in your head, Luke 137. Nothing will be impossible with God. The devil likes for us to think that things are impossible, but God will not let things be impossible. And then, we see God will provide Himself a lamb. They're talking, they're visiting along the road, and Isaac says, Dad, we've got the fire, we've got the wood, we've got what we need for sacrifice, but there's no lamb. So, what are we going to do? And he says, God will provide a lamb. God will provide. God will provide whatever is necessary. Abraham is in complete faith mode. And so he's ready to do whatever God is asking him to do. Even though he doesn't know what he's going to say to Sarah when he gets back with a boy that's not there. A boy they prayed for. A boy they cared for. The boy that they waited years for. Now remember, Abraham understands he's that this God is the creator of the universe. He will provide. Are you willing to give up whatever God asks of you? Yeah. You say, oh yeah, I'm preaching. But we don't know until we come to that moment. God has asked me to give up certain things. God has come to others and said, you need to let go of this. God will do whatever. God will take it if need be. 
And sometimes we think some things are more important than God. And God says, get that out of the way. Let go of that so you can serve me better. So I can bless you more. You know, we want to hold on to some little thing and we don't think it's, we think this little thing is the most important thing in the world and here behind God's back, He's got the greatest and the best thing that He could ever give us, but He can't give it to us until we let go of this small thing. Let go of it. And then they get it. They're traveling. He says to them, I'll be back. God will provide. Luke 14, 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You've got to give it all up so you can follow God. Now, I know that you fear God. After a very interesting experience, it would be really nice to know what Isaac thought about this. Because we really don't know what age Isaac was. He could have been 20, he could have been 15, he could have been seven. A lot of pictures that you've seen, he's little, he's young, okay? He prepares him, but apparently there wasn't any neglect or any fear in Isaac's heart. He let his father tie him up, put him on the altar, but can you imagine the size of Isaac's eyes when his father takes out a knife and wields it above his head so that he can take the sacrifice? But God says, wait, I know now that you are willing to give up anything. I know now that you trust me no matter if it's the most sacred thing in your life. The thing that you waited so long. In fact, it's the thing that I promised you. But you're willing to let go of it and give it up. Now I know that you fear God. Folks, don't be surprised if God has put you to the test. He will. He puts you to the test not to see you fail. He does not enjoy seeing you fail. Now, I don't know about you, but I had some teachers and some professors that enjoyed watching me fail. <laughs> they would uh, give you questions on the test out of the uh, footnotes of the book. But God doesn't want you to fail. He wants you to succeed. The Lord will provide. You fear God. You respect. You trust Him with what it is. And because of this, you shall be blessed. New covenant, a new agreement between the two of them because of faithful obedience to God. Well, before we close today, let's go to another mount of decision. A mount called Mount Calvary. Jesus was challenged in obedience there. Do you realize that Jesus just like us, was put to the test. You know, there was no certain outcome. He was tested. And we know that Jesus knew what waited ahead. But He obeyed God's direction. John 12. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In his death, Jesus would bless a harvest of souls for the kingdom. He knew that, but he also knew the, co the cost of it. Let me tell you what the cost was. Whenever one of us who are Christians are on our deathbed and death is coming for us, we have... God there. God is with us. But look at the cross. Jesus didn't have God there. God had to turn His back on Him because He had become sin. Because He had taken all the sins of the world upon Himself. So, Jesus knew the cost of what lay ahead. He was born 
the Savior Himself, was challenged to trust in God's plan. Luke 22, 41 through 42. And He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and He knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if You are willing, remove this cup from Me. Nevertheless, not My will, but Yours be done. See, He had the challenge. We think of Jesus, I think we kind of make Jesus into a superhero and forget about the human side of him. He knew what was coming and he had this thing happening and his goal wasn't to have a good life and enjoy his life. At any moment, he could have just said, forget this, I'm out of here. But what did he do? He was obedient to the will of his Father. He knew what the cost was going to be. God became the Lamb. He provided the Lamb here on this hill. John 10, 17 through 18. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. The charge I have received from my Father. Jesus wasn't killed. Jesus wasn't murdered. Jesus wasn't a political prisoner. All these different things. Jesus willingly laid down His life as the Lamb of God. So that's the Savior that we follow. He started a covenant based in His blood. Be obedient today. Be obedient and have the kind of faith. Trust God. Trust God to have plans made for you and He's going to work it out. It may take a long time. Abraham and Sarah lived a lot of years. And they had to trust God and they had to grow in their faith. God is a good God. He loves you. In closing, a businessman well known to be ruthless who lived in Boston at the time Mark Twain was alive told him, before I die, I need to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. This businessman was ruthless, evil, and worked for his own gain. I want to climb, he said, Mount Sinai and read the Ten Commandments aloud at the top. Mark Twain, being the ever wise and honorary character he was, said, I have a better idea. You could stay here in Boston and keep them and live them out. Live out the commands of God in your life. Listen for Him to tell you what to do. And follow after him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for what they mean to us. Thank you for what you mean to us. Father, thank you that when we know that you ask for something, we need to give it back. Or there's nothing more important in this world to us and any of us than it should be you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you work so mightily the life of Abraham to make him an example of faith. May we, Lord, be an example of faith to the world around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If God calls you to move to this altar or move down front, you come and respond to what God has done in your life. As Brother Vernon gives us leadership.